India is 75 and it's a moment for celebration, but also a moment for some serious reflection. I'm Barkhadat, you're with the Mojo Story, and our focus today is on a special anthology of nearly 100 writers, some of the best known writers of the world, in this anthology by Pen America, India at 75. The writers who have contributed to this include authors such as Chumpa Lahiri, Suketu Mehta, and of course, Salman Rushdie, who has just suffered an assassination attempt on his life and is thankfully off the ventilator and hopefully getting better. Those pictures of the stabbing, the multiple stabbings that took place on the stage sent a shiver through the spine of the world. But tragically, there has been very little commentary from political parties, left, right or centre, in India, with perhaps the sole exception of Congress Member of Parliament Shashi Tharoor. India, remember, was the first country in the world to effectively ban the satanic verses. So as India turns 75, we talk about freedom, free speech, and our country's future. With a very special guest on the program today, Suketu Mehta, who's joining us from the United States of America, who's written the foreword to this anthology, who's also, of course, the author of Maximum City, has a new upcoming book, on immigrants. This land is my land coming up later this year and of course has a lot else to talk about. Is also from home state. His home state is that of Gujarat. So Ketu, it's great uh, to see you here and before I get started uh, talking to you, I just want the audience to have a little bit uh, of a sense of the disquiet that many of you have expressed in this anthology. We can just take that banner off. Uh, this is what Suketu says, the country I love, and he calls his words an act of love, is facing the gravest threat to democracy since its founding. It is a lament that many other authors have also expressed in this anthology, uh, just out by Pen America. And Suketu actually goes on to say that the challenges facing India in the next 75 years are colossal, perhaps even greater than the first 75 years. Whether you agree with the sentiments expressed in this anthology or not, this is some of the finest writing you'll certainly find anywhere in the world. And so it's worth engaging with those ideas, irrespective of where you are on the political spectrum, left, right, center, or undecided. So Suketu, let's get um, started with a conversation that takes place against the backdrop of that brutal horrific attack on Salman Rushdie, who I know is um, not just one of the world's best authors, but also a close uh, friend of yours. And we'll, we'll, we'll get to sort of the politics and the conversation around Rushdie and satanic verses a bit later. Let's start with your comment that India is facing the gravest threat to uh, our democracy since its founding. Now, let me, let me push back a little bit here. I mean, there's a famous line of, you know, by Mark Twain that, you know, reports of my death are vastly exaggerated. And many Indians would turn around, look at what all of you have said and said, oh, this is an echo chamber of liberals. What, you know, this is predictable. This is as we expected them to say. And who really even cares about these liberals because they don't decide how Indians think, feel or vote most importantly. So I want you to start by responding to the cynicism. There will be many who will agree with you, but will you be really changing minds with what you've argued in this anthology? Thanks, Barkha. Thanks for having me on the show. Uh, we compiled the anthology and we wrote the pieces that we did, as I write in my introduction, as an act of love for India. I want this to be very clear. Uh, we are Indian authors. I uh, was born in India and I lived there for the first 14 years of my life. And then I came back to live again in India to write Maximum City. I come back every year, sometimes several times a year. Half of the authors in this anthology live in India today. We did this and I do believe that India is facing the gravest uh, threat in its uh, uh, in its independent history. And the threat is this, that you know, when India came into being, it was this wonderful dream of a country which respected religion, but did not have an official state religion, did not privilege one religion over another. This is now changing. There are actually serious proposals to have a dharmic constitution or a Hindu constitution to replace the great constitution whose 
principal author was Ambedkar, um, with uh, a constitution that makes Hinduism the official state religion. Um, even if it doesn't go that far, the threats that uh, writers, journalists, you know, people who disagree uh, with uh, the prevailing um, government ideology, um, the the attitudes of some of the judiciary towards these dissenters, you know, and here we can um, cite the examples of uh, my friends uh, Tista Settlewad, um, of um, uh, the great fact checker Zubair. Um, you know, we know the names. Most Indians know the names because they're being discussed on, on the television shows. So the danger ahead is that um, we alienate 200 million Indian Muslims, 30 million Christians, the Sikhs, um, Zoroastrians, uh, agnostics, um, uh, atheists, people who don't fit into this majoritarian ideology. And I would hate to see us turn into not just Pakistan or Iran or Afghanistan, but even Turkey. You know, we're better than this. And, and we will need to be united because, I mean, we keep talking about these religious divides, but the great danger to our country isn't terrorism. It's climate change. You live in Delhi. You know that this year, temperatures in Delhi were 49 degrees Celsius. In, you know, in just a couple of decades, you will be cooked if you step outside your house. Um, we cannot afford to split along religious lines because we have enormous challenges ahead. And this is the danger. This is what compelled us to write this anthology. This is what compels me personally to keep writing the way I do. It could be argued, and uh, you will obviously understand that my role in this conversation is also to, to, to push back on some of your arguments to enable a more complex conversation. Uh, and it could be argued that the disquiet that you express about India, the rise of populism, the marginalization, especially political, of India's Muslims, uh, diminishing freedoms in, in terms of the space for expression, these are battles not unique to India. These are battles that the world is battling. And let's go from the land of your birth, the country you love, to the country of your citizenship today, the United States of America, where women have lost uh, the right to abortion, where guns appear to have more rights than women, uh, where, uh, you know, the attack on Rushdie has not taken place in a Muslim country, but in the land of the, of the free, where, uh, you know, Black Lives Matter uh, is still... An, you know, extremely uh, debated uh, and not a uniformly sort of accepted campaign and where there is still a sizable number of pop of people who will root for Trump, irrespective of what we now know about the attempts to seize Capitol Hill. So I guess my question is, is this disquiet that you express in this anthology unique to India or is it that you care more about India because this is the country of your birth? Look, I completely agree with you. And in fact, I have written a book length document of dissent, uh, um, uh, which relates to the country of my citizenship, the United States. So my book, This Land is Our Land, came out last year. It is available in India. There are excerpts of it uh, uh, all over the web. There are interviews that I've done. And, you know, it, both the countries that are dearest to me, the United States and India, are both under the gravest threats to their democracy since their founding. I absolutely agree with you. India is not unique. The same thing is happening in the United States. There are some 70 million people who voted for Trump. And I'd say about 50 million of those believe that the election was stolen. So for the first time in American democracy, there is a crisis of legitimacy when it comes to elections. Right. Mm -hmm. And what is the role of a writer? Look, I'm a writer. I'm not a politician. I'm not an economist. I'm not a demographer. What I can do is write. We are canaries in a coal mine. And so all over, uh, throughout history, writers have said things that are unpopular. I'm not a PR uh, flack. My job is to see things as I call it. Um, and if I am attacked for it, well, you know, that comes with the territory. I mean, my dear close friend, Salman, all his life since he wrote The Satanic Verses has been attacked and he almost came close to paying with his life for believing in writing what he does. And you know what? 
we are seeing over and over again the the words that he've written not just about islam but about hinduism he has a piece in our anthology about india he's motivated by the same love for india he will call it as he sees it in whatever country and 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 so do we as writers this is what we do this is our dharma yeah and i think that's fair enough and in fact since you mentioned salman's contribution to this anthology i want to actually bring up what he has written just some uh, sort of key uh, key sentences that really stayed uh, with me uh, and salman basically talks about the dream of fellowship and liberty uh that he believes is dead or close to death in india this is from the same pen america anthology on india at uh, 75 uh as uh, suketu said uh he has always been someone who's never pulled his punches and this time uh this is more than a cervix it actually sounds anguished uh he says he writes a shadow lies upon the country we loved so deeply and the final uh sort of kicker as it were is the is the cruelest blow and i call it cruel because this is the sentence that really haunted me uh, is the one that you're going to see on your screen uh, shortly he says hindustan isn't hamara anymore so that idea of the inclusive all encompassing all embracing india according to salman rushdie uh, is fading and fading fast uh, so kitu do you think and i'll get to the free speech debate in a moment but do you think that the staggering silence of the political right left and center with the one exception of shashi tharoor and even he wasn't um, as a politician willing to sort of support a uh, free speech uh, in an absolute sense uh, do you think that staggering silence is explained by the fact that people like salman people like yourselves have actually been in a sense equal opportunity offenders you're not you're not todies of one or the other political dispensation you've had problems with dif- different dispensations and in that way the right wing which otherwise is always speaking up against islamist violence is actually not spoken up political right wing i mean on what's happened to sagar i think it's shameful i think it's shameful that india's politicians have spoken up in defense of uh, salman look there's no islam exception to free speech you know i reserve the right to talk uh, uh, you know it, out of sincere motives about any god and if what i say offends you or your god in a sense that's your problem i'm not doing it and what salman's written he's not doing it to consciously offend anyone but if incidentally people are offended you know that in a sense is their problem we can't have a country in which before we write something before we say something we have to carefully calibrate who might be offended look if i say um you know it is cold outside my window it might offend someone who resolutely believes that it is warm outside you know it's what's the definition of free speech um there are certain reasonable limits to to speech right i mean and different countries have different standards in the united states the classic definition of free speech is um you have the right to freedom of free speech uh, freedom of speech but you do not have the right to yell fire in a crowded theater because that would set up a stampede and people would die in india um it doesn't have a first amendment we don't have this kind of unqualified um a free speech we do recognize other limitations on speech it is a country much more prone to religious violence so the government imposes certain one would hope reasonable restrictions on what people can say to inflame a mob and i recognize that different countries should have different standards but i submit that india has gone too far the other way so you know the ridiculous cases against zubair for example of um you know putting out a tweet uh, about a historical fact about you know wars in gaza or whatever um the, all, all these movies which are getting banned um because it's offended someone or other here i mean i was part of the screenwriting team that wrote uh, mission kashmir and i remember there was a scene in the movie where there is a policeman who happens to be sick he's standing over a bomb and he mm. urinates because he's so scared and there was a delegation of sikhs who had uh, they were self appointed guardians of sikh pride and they demanded that the movie be banned because this scene 
shows poorly on the martial valor of the Sikhs. I mean, this is ridiculous. It's got nothing to do with Sikhs. He just happens to be a, a human being who's scared, right? So, look, we have a censor board, which in the United States we don't. Uh, different countries have different standards. But, you know, if we impose these restrictions, you won't be able to do your show. I won't be able to publish my books because who knows who might be offended. So we rely on the judiciary to make these decisions about where does speech go too far. We rely on the libel and defamation laws. Um, the issue is that, you know, much of the restrictions on speech in India um, when it's imposed by the government or much of the judiciary happens to fall on Muslims. Um, it should be equal opportunity. I mean, Salman couldn't speak at the Jaipur Literary Festival because there were Muslims in Jaipur again. And, you know, you had to interview him over, over video link. Um, I absolutely think Salman should be able to come to Jaipur and speak. I mean, he is uh, arguably the country's, uh, the country's greatest um, living English language novelist. And it's an absolute shame that he can't come to India and speak on a public forum. But, but you know, the, what you talk about happened on the watch of a Congress state government. Uh, it was, it, 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 you know, at the time in, in 2000 and when was it 12, I think, when I actually had to lock myself into a room in Diggy Palace and interview him. He was in a London studio. Uh, the threats were so out of hand that we couldn't even, he couldn't even officially join the festival on a video link. That's actually how, got, how bad it got. And so I interviewed him using subterfuge and parceling him off to a London studio. Uh, it was a Congress government. And I guess the question I'm asking is this, do you believe, and I've seen this debate kind of raging uh, in India in the last few weeks, that secularists, liberals, progressives have also failed Salman because of a certain amount of equivocation because of satanic verses uh, that's the first question and secondly the congress does not have i mean you know your your lament in india at 75 is about the present dispensation but the congress does not have a sterling record at all on free speech either i will direct you to an op-ed i wrote uh, in the new york times this was during the manmohan singh government talking about exactly this the threats to uh, freedom of um, uh, speech in India, and yes, under a Congress government. I mean, the Congress did not cover itself with glory. But I submit that the BJP has been worse, that these threats to freedom of speech have been, become much worse recently. Um, and that's because it's not just the government. And this is what truly alarms us, that you know, a large section of the country, of the citizenry, needs now to be convinced that freedom of speech is a good thing. They believe that, you know, um, you can say what you want, but you can't offend our gods. You can't offend uh, Ram or Sita or Lakshmi or, you know, whoever you can't. So the very act of, uh, say, a Muslim painter, you know, Hussein, for example, um, who painted um, really just incredibly worshipful um paintings of Saraswati, for example. This was, you know, I remember Bal Thakare was on a crusade against Hussein, and Hussein shamefully had to leave the country and died in exile in the Middle East. So this has been going for, on for a long time, but it's now really, it's not just the government. We again need to explain to Indians why free speech is a good thing. And may I just, I'll give you just one example of why free speech is good. And this is by the great Nobel Prize winning um, uh, economist Amartya Sen, who he won his Nobel Prize because of his studies of um, famine in uh, Bengal. And he points out that right after independence, we Indians largely abolished mass famine. I mean, we still have huge malnutrition, but famine in the 1960s, we dealt with. China did not. China lost 20 million people in the Great Leap Forward due to famine. Why? Because China did not have a free press. India did. So if someone died in a Chinese village, there was no free press press they weren't you know the, the newspapers weren't making a huge scandal about it in india they did and not just at the center but regional newspapers in oriya newspapers bengali newspapers anytime there were reports of starvation they made a hue and cry the opposition made a hue and cry and the government had to respond and send resources free speech saves lives that's well said that is well said free speech saves lives and yet at the other end of the spectrum of this debate 
is a woman called Nupur Sharma, the now suspended spokeswoman of the BJP. And ever since the attack on Salman Rushdie, not the political right wing, but the base of the party, the BJP's far right base, has been making the argument that look at all these liberal hypocrites, they all stood up for Salman Rushdie, but nobody stood up for the right of Nupur Sharma to make the comments that she did on Prophet Muhammad. Now, I would submit to you, and I'd be curious to know your response. Um, and I'm obviously, there's no, I mean, I'm not drawing an equivalence between a BJP spokeswoman and one of the world's finest writers. But the principle at the heart of it, I personally think that Nupur Sharma was being hateful because her intent seemed to be to just take down a religion but i do not believe that she should go to jail for it nor do i believe that she should be threatened in the manner that she has or be criminally prosecuted and when the right wing says how do you stand up for salman but not stand up for nupur sharma you would say what okay uh, i must admit in all honesty i haven't followed the nupur sharma uh debate i haven't uh, but, but, but the concept is, when does free speech get termed to be hate speech, right? Well, I, and, I don't and... agree that Nupur Sharma should have the right to say what she does. Now, the question is, you know, as I said earlier, different countries have different restrictions on speech, right? So India is much more sensitive to religion. So, you know, if I, on your show, started saying obscene and pornographic things about the profits of any religion, you know, there should be restrictions for this which India imposes which in the US, by the way, doesn't. I could you know, say this, I could write all kinds of things. Uh, Europe, for example, makes it a crime to deny the Holocaust. Um, and you can be jailed for saying uh, that there was no Holocaust in France, in Germany. So, which has not deterred people from saying that there was no Holocaust. They've just been driven underground. They say it on the chat forums. You know? so, uh, so if you ban certain things in India, if you ban Nupur Sharma from saying things about the prophet, she will still say it, but it'll be driven underground, right? So, uh, you know, the, the debate is, what is reasonable? What are reasonable restrictions on free speech? And I absolutely agree, there shouldn't be a double standard. As I said before, I don't believe in an Islam exception to free speech. This is why when Salman Rushdie defended uh, the... Uh, Pen America uh, uh, was giving a, an award to uh, Charlie Hebdo. This was the French magazine which had printed um, cartoons about uh, uh, the prophet. Um, and he resolutely stood up for um, uh, Charlie Hebdo, the, uh, uh, the cartoonists, um, the people who were working at the magazine. And there were over a hundred American writers who signed a petition demanding that the honors be uh, withdrawn. And I was completely on Salman's side. You know, freedom of expression, there needs to be one standard. It can't be different standards for different religions. So there I totally agree with you. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that, because I think uh, what happens is that, that different uh, sort of groups tie themselves in knots because there's this kind of cherry picking uh, of free speech. And it actually weakens the argument uh, in support of free speech uh, for everybody. Now, here's my question. In going back to the anthology, uh, India 75, there's obviously a great deal of disquiet about the place of Indian Muslims. And in India, too, there is a ferocious ongoing debate over the relationship between the state and religion. Now, globally, we have different examples to pick from. We have France that doesn't want any visible display of faith, for example, in publicly funded institutions. Uh, in India, you have had at the other end of the spectrum, uh, the hijab becoming uh, so fiercely contested that girls are being, young women are being kept out of schools and colleges. Uh, the Nehruvian idea of, of, of the place of religion was very different from the Gandhian idea. And as you grapple in this anthology with the place of religion in a multicultural, multi-religious society, how do you see that relationship in an ideal way? So I grew up Hindu and uh, uh, I'm proud to be Hindu. Um, I go to Hindu temples. I have a, a little mandir at home. Um, my Hinduism is such an incredibly open, inclusive religion. It has space for everyone, including atheists. There were Hindu philosophers um, who didn't believe in God. You know, there was Charvaka, the material philosopher. There were um, Hinduism took in 
gods from every religion and, and made them its own. I mean, there's 300 million gods, so you know, you can pick and choose your god. My problem with the BJP and the RSS is that they are demanding that we follow one idea of Hinduism. It's as if for, in the US, for example, Christianity was defined by, I don't know, the Southern Baptists uh, or the Catholics. You know, it's so I grew up in Calcutta, in Bombay. And look, both my grandfathers were actively involved with the RSS. Most of my family, <laughs> Gujarati, most of my family really loves Modi. And I have huge arguments with them all the time. Uh, you know, I don't want India to be like all these other crappy little countries which glorify one God over all the others. I, you know, I love it that we have this system of uh, personal laws where the state is not secular in the French sense. We don't have a laïcité. Um, we respect all religions, but the definitive word is all. And my issue with what's going on in India right now is that one religion is being privileged over all the others. And, you know, I say this in, at the India Today conclave, like, even if you hate Muslims, I tell my family, what do you think is going to happen? This is 200 million Indian Muslims, and they voted with their feet. They didn't come from somewhere else. They were here all along. They chose which God to worship, and they are patriotic because during partition, they didn't move to Pakistan. They stayed here, and they're building a nation. If you alienate them, then you're going to have a civil war which will make partition look like a schoolyard brawl. Because now the Muslims aren't along in Punjab and Bengal. They're in every nook and cranny of the country. And I'm seeing this, and this really saddens me, the growing alienation, the othering of Indian Muslims, you know, telling them you don't belong here. So what happens is the elite leave, they go to the Middle East, they go to uh, Europe, America. And at the lower levels, you know, I remember I was in, um, in India earlier this year, and I was speaking to a Muslim man in an Indian village, and he, I asked him who he was going to vote for, and he said, Am I really the you know, he doesn't see in the Indian political system that someone who speaks for him, not Congress, not Trinamool, and this is really dangerous in the long run. You cannot yeah. afford to alienate the world's third biggest Muslim polity and not have consequences in the long run. But, you know, finally, uh, what that Muslim uh, man who felt he'd run out of options uh, says to me is the failure of alternative politics. Uh, and, and, and then I want to ask you, you know, the fact is that you and Salman and Shumpa can write these beautiful essays and, uh, you know, some of us can raise issues that we seek to hold the government to account on. For example, I'm extremely agitated at the moment uh, about uh, Bilkis Bano, a woman uh, from Gujarat who was gang raped. Her daughter was killed, uh, her mother was raped, and she fought for 17 years. And now the Gujarat government has just ordered executively that her um, her killers and her rapists, I mean, rather her child's killers and her rapists, her mother's rapists, walk free uh, ahead of time. So we have all of these issues that we all try and highlight in, in our own way. My question to you is this. Till alternative politics finds a language that captures mass imagination, uh, are people like you, are people like me and others not speaking to, preaching to the converted, so to speak? And is the failure of alternative politics really a failure of storytelling? I ask you this because you're an excellent storyteller. You're one of the world's finest writers. And I actually think that Prime Minister Modi keeps winning because what he says to people catches something in their response system. And we can't ignore that. You can't just keep telling people, oh, he's doing this wrong, so don't vote for him because they're not listening. So I wrote in my recent book, This Land is Our Land, what is a populist? What is Modi, Putin, Trump, Bolsonaro, Erdogan? A populist is a gifted storyteller, someone who can tell a false story well. So the story that's being spread in India is that India is a Hindu country and all other religions live here by Hindu suffrage. That's a false story, but it's got emotive appeal. If you are being taught in your textbooks that, you know, Hindus were here all along and other religions came and raped and pillaged. So we need to go back to some ancient imagined glorious Hindu past. Um, you know, in the United States, 
uh, Trump's appeal is that, well, this is basically a white country and everyone else who came here, including us Indians, are latecomers and should live here according to white rules. A populist is a gifted storyteller, someone who can tell a false story. Well, the only way he can be fought is by telling a true story better. And this is why we writers, journalists, are being attacked and persecuted all over the world. Because we know how to tell stories, we know how to fact check stories, right? So you're absolutely right. We need to go out of our bubbles. We need to go out of the ivory towers. We need to go out of the newsrooms. And we have to go and tell stories and not, not become advocates. I'm, you know, Some of us may want to become politicians. I mean, Gandhiji was, of course, a great journalist before he became a politician. He's, Founded newspaper and also and also a great storyteller. He had ideas that mobilized the people at large. Exactly. So I do agree with you that if we have a fault, it is that we stay in our bubbles. This is why, for example, in the United States, uh, uh, a few months ago, I went on the show of a man named Dinesh D'Souza, who is hated by the left here. He is a Bombay boy like me, and. Um, you know, his nickname in certain left quarters is Distort Tinuza because he, um, he, I mean, he, he's argued that slavery wasn't so bad. He's, you know, defended some of the most, to me, objectionable tenets of the, um, uh, uh, of the right wing. But you know what? I went on his show and I spoke about immigration, why immigration in America is a good thing. And yes, 90% of the people on his show hated me and, you know, sent all these comments. But 10% of them said, well, it's brave of this man to come on the show because we don't ever see a liberal on the Dinesh D'Souza show. Um, yeah. Which is why, I, you know, I'd be happy to go on, I don't know, Republic TV or any of these uh, Indian shows and, and yell and shout and make my point. This is what free speech is about. It's not just speaking to people who agree with you. This is why I argue with my relatives. I think these arguments we have around the dinner table everywhere are good things you know this is a healthy democracy uh, having this yell and scrum of debate it's not going to be pretty this is why i don't believe like some on the left that um you know speakers i disagree with should not be allowed on university campuses I, you know i've said to you earlier that i believe that uh, trump should not have been banned on twitter uh, because he went off and, you know, started his own social media campaign. He's not any less popular because Twitter banned him. So the yeah. suppression of speech doesn't ensure that that speech doesn't come out. It will come out some way or the other, you know, and, it'll, and if you suppress it, it could come out explosively. Yeah, and cancel culture in, in the end is a zero-sum game, uh, you know, so your cancel culture... Uh, uh, May, may, may seem more unfair than mine, but in the end, I mean, look what's happening with J.K. Rowling and so on. Rushdie himself has been uh, sort of not allowed on various campuses. There have been protests in the past against Narendra Modi. I mean, they're all, and, and I'm glad, therefore, you've spoken up for the right to everyone to express themselves as long as that language is not inciting violence uh, uh, I, against another community. I, I have to close. If I had to ask you the one thing, you, you, we've spoken a lot about what worries you about India. Uh, let's end with what the one thing that gives you hope. We've kept the army out of politics so far. Unlike our neighbors, you know, this is India's signal achievement that there has been the separation between the army and the politics. It's not always been perfect. And again, lately, you know, some of these statements made by uh, people in the Indian Armed Forces, you know, um, they, they worried me. But on the whole, um, India is a democracy. Uh, the army doesn't uh, decide uh, how we vote. And all over the countries, this, all over the world, these, uh, so many of these post-colonial regimes um, have seen coup after coup after coup. And we have not done this. This, for me, is India's signal achievement that there has been a separation of the armed forces uh, and um, uh, civilian uh, rule. Okay. I'll tell you another thing about the military, having studied it closely, it is actually a deeply pluralistic tradition. Uh, and you have the ideas of the Mandir Masjid Gurdwara and the Sarv Dharam Sthals, the multi-faith 
places of worship or the commanding officer takes on, for example, the faith of his troops during all festivals. So there's a lot uh, uh, there to actually learn from, especially when we talk about the intermingling of religions. So it's interesting that you should uh, mention that. Uh, thank you, Suketu. Uh, like I said, India at 75, an anthology of 100 writers, Suketu Mehta, among them uh, calling this anthology an act of love. So read it, even if you don't agree with it, because as we just agreed, you have to engage with even those you ferociously disagree with. So Ketu, thanks. Always a pleasure. Take care. Thanks, Barkha. Thanks so much for having Thank me you. on. Thank you. It's great to see you here. Thank you for watching our work. If you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to click the bell icon and subscribe to Mojo Story and support independent, robust journalism.